We move now to the reading of the Gospel of Matthew as we read of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. Let us hear the word of God. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethsaida on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and we will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you gentle and wise on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkeys and the colt. They placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. And a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others took <coughs> branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus entered the temple court and drove out all those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the table of the money chain and the benches of the selling God. It is written, he said to them, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, and the children shouting in the temple court, Hosanna to the son of David. They were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read? From the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your faith. And he left them and went out to the city of Bethany where he spent the night. Through the marvel of technology, as I have shared these words, and may God, by the way, bless these words to our hearts and minds, let's just get a little bit of a glimpse of what it may have been like on that time.
what mixed emotion our Lord must have had on that day. Knowing that morning message as we continue in our series on in Lent is I'm not going to make too many promises. How many of you have ever said that to your children or grandchildren who live in a day and age where promises are often not kept? I mentioned in my Facebook post this week that uh, promises can be high trust promises. Promises easily made and easily broken. We're going to consider today why some people follow Jesus. If we look at the crowd and if we look at people today. I'm reading this John, chapter 26, both from the NIV, and then from the message. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the love and had to accept. Eugene Peterson in the message, if Jesus answered you, come looking for me, not because you saw God in my actions, but because I said to you, fill your stomach and go pray. That day when people lined the streets, they promised to follow Jesus, their sign of their acclamation and their glory and their praise. They may not have said it with their lips, but by their actions, they wanted to follow Jesus Christ. But, many of them were seeking Jesus not for what he could do for them, not for who he is. A means to an end. What can Jesus do for me. I think there was a commercial for, uh, for, this, for the uh, UPS or something. What can Brown do for you years ago? And so many of the people that won the streets that day were interested in what Jesus could do for them. Uh, excuse me, what, what they could get out of following Jesus. If you think about the feeding of the 5,000 in that passage I read a few minutes ago. Two feedings, the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000. By the way, that didn't include men and that just did not include women and children. I uh, just mentioned that there were 5,000 men who were fed, but there were children and women as well. And so I often wonder, where were those people later during Palm Sunday? Where were all the people who had promised to follow Jesus? Where did they go? Where were they when Jesus was arrested as word spread through the streets that night? Where were they the next morning when Jesus took that walk, carrying his own cross on the road to Calvary? Some of those in the crowd promised to follow Jesus for the material thing, that God would grant them what they A lot of people back then, and a lot of people today, make promises to follow Jesus. They kind of see God as Santa Claus. That God will give them whatever they want. And when they don't get what they want, they abandon God. The story is told in the life of Ted Turner in CNN. This is a very early age went to church, had a very good Christian upbringing, but he had a sister at a young age that he got. And as a result of that experience, he walked away from God. And I've said many times before that when you and I go through a crisis in life, it will do one of two things to you. It will draw you closer to our Lord or you will go further away from it. Someone once said, you know, if you feel like God isn't near you, get to move. Many people follow Jesus for material things that God would grant them the things in this life. Then there are people who promise to follow Jesus 
because they seek an emotional heart and they want to be entertained. Uh, I think it's very important for church services to be creative and I try to be creative in my sermons and in my stories. But there, are, there is a segment of people who are drawn to Jesus because they want an emotional heart. They want to feel good. They want to be entertained. We've bought in our culture and society today the ability to probably sit five minutes without being entertained or having a story for a day. And so you can see in the crowd that there were people that were very excited. They were excited because they thought Jesus was going to be the king. And their hopes were that later that week. I remember years ago talking to a young man, probably 17, 18 years of age, and he was baptized as an infant, but he wanted to be baptized again. And that's the term for another day. And when I asked this young man, why is it that you want to be baptized again? And he started talking about the feeling. Now listen, there's nothing wrong with an emotional time. There's nothing wrong with good feelings. I hope you feel good uh, as you worship God each day. But our relationship with God, our Christian walk and our Christian faith, it's not by feelings. Feelings are like roller coasters up and down. Some people promise to follow Jesus so that they might have power and position. You know, I, in my 35 years of ministry working with all kinds of churches on presbytery level, I want you to think about what I'm going to say. It doesn't sound, it sounds like a contradiction. But I've known churches where the session in the church is not the session. It could be a particular family in the life of the church that calls the shots. It could be a person that contributes the most money in the life of the church. It could be a woman's association. There are people that come to Jesus because of how. And I think of the scriptures in Bible study and studying the Gospel of Mark. I, I was thinking about this this week where Jesus tells his disciples that he's going to be betrayed, he's going to be crucified. And in the next breath, James and John, you know what they say? They don't say, oh Jesus, that's terrible. This is terrible what's going to happen to you. You know what they say in the next breath? Hey Jesus, when you enter your kingdom, can I sit at the left and my brother sit on the right hand when you enter the kingdom of God? That's for power. That's not the right reason for following Jesus. And another gospel is, is James and John's mother after Jesus gets done telling them about his trip to the cross and what they would do to the son of man. And, and the mother of James and John says, doesn't say Jesus was so sorry to do that. I was so sad. I was so sorry. He says, oh, by the way, Jesus, when you enter your kingdom, the son of man, when you enter your kingdom, would you grant that my son sit on your left and on your right hand side? There are people who make promises to follow Jesus. There are people in churches who do so for the power and the authority that they can have. A number of years ago, there was a couple attending my church and after about four or five weeks of coming, gentleman said to me, I have a question for you, Pastor Rock. I said, okay, what is the question? And I thought he was going to ask, Pastor, how do you become a member of this church? We really like it here. We've met some good friends. We like you as a pastor. How do we become a member here? But you know what this gentleman said to me? I have a question for you. How do I become an elder in this church? Wow. Now, does that 
should raise some red flag. It did for me. Unfortunately for others in the church, they didn't see anything wrong with that. It actually caused a great division and problem in the life of the church. So that people sometimes come into the life of the church, sometimes people become involved in the crowd because of seeking power of position and authority. I don't have to remind you that there are those who follow Christ for money and profit. If you think back over the last 20, 30, 40 years of a scandal of prominent pastors who have television and or radio ministry. You know, I think of the, of the Bakers and TTL. Do you remember TTL? Did you know that in TTL where Jim and Tammy Baker uh, had their place, uh, that if you walked into their bathrooms that um, the faucets were gold plated? I'll never forget after TTL crumbled. Never forget a woman being interviewed. She said, well, how do you, and, you know, his reporters, he said, how do you feel? But the reporter asked this woman, how do you feel about what happened to Jim Baker stepping down from TTL? And you know what she said? She said, TTL, listen to this thing, TTL without Jim Baker is like heaven without Jesus. Wow. I would have looking for the lightning bolt. Right? So there are people who follow Christ and make promises to follow Christ and they use it for money. Because of the money changers, right? And again, the problem with the money changers wasn't that there were animals in the courtyard that were being sold. You know, we learned that right when we were little kids. You know, the problem was they were taking advantage of people. They were of a slight value. You know, I lived in Florida and a hurricane was coming. And uh, whatever the price of wood is, you know, $50 for a piece of plywood all of a sudden went to $100. And hotel rooms that were maybe 120 all of a sudden go up to $300 to spend the night. That's why Jesus was upset and he drove the money to Jesus out. Some people promise to follow Jesus in order to see signs and wonders. The Bible says one day some of the Jewish leaders, including some Pharisees, came to Jesus asking him to show them a miracle. But Jesus replied, only an evil, faithless nation would ask for further proof. And none will be given, except what happened to Jonah, the prophet. For as Jonah was in the great fish for three days and three nights, so I, the prophet, shall be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. You know, there are people who want to come to Jesus and they want to follow Jesus, but they want to see some signs and wonders. And a lot of times for us, it's when we're going through a personal fight. And we pray, God, please heal this person. Please help this person find your job. Please be still from there. And it doesn't happen. And so the people say, I'm done with you. I wonder how many people need to see. At one time, people still need to use and refuse to block their nation. How many of them walk through that? And they're promised to follow Jesus as they stood and as they made membership vows to, to the Lord and to others. They were very sincere at that time, but somehow that sincerity is wrong. And they're no longer to be found. Jesus said, Do you want a sign? I'm not going to give it to you. The only sign is when the Son of God will be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. So what are some reasons to follow Jesus? If these are the reasons not to follow Jesus. Just a couple of very simple reasons. And I hope that this is 
in the heart, in your heart, as you come into worship today. We follow Jesus and we make promises because we love Jesus. You know, the people that we love in this world, we love them because of who they are. It is to be unconditional love. I cringe when I hear families and people in the church when they say, well, I will, I will do this, um, but if this happens, Pastor, you make a decision I don't like. Session, you make a decision I don't like. I'm heading for the door. We serve Jesus because we love Him. And He is important to the people who love us. And that's what drives us to serve. Because we love Jesus. How can you not love Jesus for what He's done for you? How can you not be committed to Him? I think of a cartoon years ago that I had posted. I think I lost it in my notes over the years. It was a, a person out on the golf course on Sunday morning. And in the lower right hand corner of the, of, the, of the cartoon, there was a picture of Jesus in the garden. And from the picture of Jesus with the man playing on Sunday morning, the words were, Who do not watch this man? One hour. And that's what Jesus prayed in the garden, right? In the disciples' place. I hope you follow Jesus and you have promised to follow him because you love him. He, he loves you and you love him. Secondly, we want to serve him. Jesus said, I've come not to be served, but to serve. The disciples didn't like that message. Remember the last supper? And the disciples would walk dusty roads and it was hospitality to wash your guests' feet. To bring some healing, they would often probably put lotion or oil on them. And so Jesus is there with the disciples. Jesus says something. Pulls up his tunic, ties it off, grabs a basin of water, and he gets down and he begins to walk to the type of feet. And I think it's Peter who says, No, 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 no. You don't wash our feet. We wash your feet. Jesus says, Come not to be served, but to serve. You follow Jesus to serve Jesus and to serve Jesus alone. You follow Jesus. I hope you have promised to follow Jesus because you want to learn from him. Learning from you. So this is the trial period of all these things. This is what prepares us to meet God. Just like in school, it's the quizzes that prepare you for the big test. And so as we follow Jesus, the child of God will want to learn more and more and more about Him. Every believer should be involved in some kind of Bible study, a situation, studying God's word to get to know who Jesus is. So we follow Jesus because we want to learn. We learn more in one year of obedience to Jesus than in hundred years of studying theology. We all have spent three years in seminary. I'm not I'm sure that's the true statement. But we follow Jesus. We love him. We want to be obedient to him. And you know what? It's not a burden. It shouldn't be a burden for you to say, Oh, it's Sunday, I've got to go to church. I've got to go to Bible study. Or how about this one? Oh, I've got to go to another meeting. Right? We serve God and we desire to obey. Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is We follow Jesus to praise and glorify God. 
when you come to church this morning, it's not about me. It's not about Elaine and the music she plays. It's not about the children. It's about Jesus. We come to glorify God. Even when the sermon, the pastor's sermon is not what it should be. Even when Elaine occasionally hits a bad note, we are here to praise and to worship Jesus and serve one another. So Jesus, as we come to this conclusion, Jesus, as we enter the world on change, he not only came to be their Lord, but their Savior. And you see, they didn't get that. They wanted Jesus to literally sit on the throne as David had sat. But God has given us an everlasting kingdom, a better kingdom in which we serve. He can satisfy our needs. Jesus is the only one that can satisfy our needs. You know, in these days of COVID, where unfortunately things such as alcoholism and drug addiction have been on the rise, divorce, violence, suicide, you know, people turn to many things. By the way, just watch your promotion. I said it a few weeks ago. Watch your promotion. See how the gambling industry is seeking to suck you in to make it easier for you to make money. And they are paying out millions of dollars to people, believing that that would be doubled or tripled. And so when we go through a crisis, who do we turn to? Time to the Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the word of the Son of God. You can hear it and say, Peter replied, Master, to whom will we go? You have the word of real life, eternal life. We've already committed ourselves, confident, that you are the Holy One of God. As I close, I don't know if you caught in the video of Jesus coming into Jerusalem. There was a young woman that approached Jesus. And if you're a good lip reader, I will show this again in years to come. If you're a good lip reader, you look at Jesus and Jesus. May God be with us as we go out into the world and realize that the people that you and I come in contact with, that those who seek to follow Jesus and promise to follow Jesus may not be following Jesus for the rest of us. We pray. Lord, we thank you for your word today. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us the good reasons because we love you and we serve you. We want to obey you. We want to learn about it. And so, Lord, give us that understanding that as we go out 